send us and the Holy Spirit make us worthy of Lord, say thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. This time, I want to complete what we had done, especially at the end of the last time, and begin something very, uh, let's say, dependent on it, or something very close, or other continuation of what we had started, is the celebration of the Eucharist, which is the most fundamental worship prayer in the Orthodox churches, the Catholic, and all the uh, apostolic churches. So since the beginning, this was the case that the, uh, when they came together, it was not praise and worship. It was uh, praise and worship in a certain style in the presence of the bread and wine and the, the transformation that happens. I'm going to share the screen with you and we'll continue reading. Uh, just to repeat the last two verses of... Uh, the Gospel of John chapter 6, and then we'll go to uh, St. Paul, just to kind of complete our reading of the Eucharist, the Gospels or the New Testament references of the Eucharist. So when we go to John 6 again and just read the last two verses, and it is chapter 6, I said ch chapter 6 is very important that we need to keep uh, in mind that there was no uh, Eucharist, Eucharist or Last Supper narrative in John. <clears throat> we only have chapter 6 speaking about the bread from heaven. At the very end, um, that's the last part. So... Uh, Jesus answered them and said, did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? And so on, comments and says, he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So when he mentioned him, he mentioned him in two pieces. Um, in one piece, he said, but there are some of you, Jesus saying to the apostles, who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. So it's very obvious that he's linking the betrayal to the not believing. It's an excess, ex, you know, an extra step. You go from non-believing and then after that betrayal. Then at the end of the chapter, he went on to say, there is one that's a devil. And that one that's a devil is he's spoken very clearly, Sean, the writer of the Gospels, say, it was Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, but what it would he would be he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So I want us just to start there and say in the Gospel of St. John, there is a link between the Eucharist and the betrayal of Judas. It's a and here is not very clear why, but then it will become more clearer as we read Paul. Okay. Is everybody with me on this point? You see that in, we, last time we talked about the, the body and blood and the insistence of Jesus about giving his own body and his own blood and uh, how, how he said there's two gifts. The gift of the Father is the Son. And the gift of the Son is his own body and blood. And in the body and the blood, Jesus gives himself to us. So now why, are, why is Judas brought in here? So I've, I've, I hope that we are on this point. Otherwise, that next piece will be very vague. And not clear. Okay, so the next piece is 1 Corinthians 11. And I would start with 10 first, then we'll go to 11. I'm sorry, that's John. Let's go back. 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 10 and it's verse 17. Um, so he says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Listen to this coming one. For we, though many, 
are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So he's linking being one body to partaking of that one loaf of bread that we divide in our Eucharistic assembly. So uh, when you go to the next chapter, and it's verse 23, this piece is called an institution of the Lord's Supper. And references is all the accounts of the Last Supper from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So what does he say? For I received, he said, from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you, received and delivered. Um, so it's, re it's a transmission of a tradition. These words were part of the Eucharistic uh, uh, celebration in the first century, just as they are today. Remembrance and amnesis is far more than thinking back about something. It is participation in it. In the Eucharist, we participate in Christ's human nature, his body and his blood. The Jews were permitted to eat meat, but not blood, for the life is in the blood. And life belongs to God. Now that the Israel of God, the church, breaks his fast, this fast and feasts, um, as it were, by eating Christ's body and drinking his blood in the divine liturgy. We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. For we presently celebrate the Eucharist in Christ's invisible presence. Though one day we will feast with him face to face in his kingdom. So this is the delivered and received. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. I want to tell you something when I was ordained. And it's a very old tradition. I went to the monastery for 40 days. And I remember they said, on such day and day, we'll deliver to you the Eucharist. So I understood it clearly. Although I was ordained in the church outside the monastery, I was not yet uh, entrusted with celebrating the liturgy on my own. I was not entrusted to carry on the body and blood of Christ and distribute it yet. I had to, to receive it from an older priest. And on that day, an older monk, who is a priest, came and uh, he, had, he helped me pray the liturgy for the first time. And um, I carried the body and blood of Christ. It was a very awesome day, very solemn. Uh, and I still remember it till today. And this is what I received. So he delivered it. I received it. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. See, this key word. Now, why betrayed? Why not the night he was delivered? Now, why not that the night he was captured? The night that... Um, uh, of his agony. Why betrayed? He, he had to, to kind of start that account with the word of betrayal. And on that night when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it and said, so there's three actions. He took, he gave thanks, he broke. And then he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup, took, and he gave thanks. And also it's, it's implied here. And he, uh, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death he, until he comes. Then he continues to say, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Okay, now we're coming closer to the idea. What happens? What happens and why it is important that the person discern what they're doing, especially with this subject. I want to read the commentary on this 27. This is also study by to receive Christ's body and blood in an unworthy manner means coming to him with hidden immorality, disunity, doctrinal heresy, or disorder, failing to see the gifts of God as holy things for holy people. So that's why we war I warn everybody, if you are in a, any kind of grave sin, don't approach the Eucharist until you have confessed it. And the second one, if you have hate, 
and grudges against someone. If you don't have the belief of the church, the, the doctrinal uh, orthodoxy, the, the orthodox doctrine, the, the straight right doctrine of the church, or acting in disorder in any manner. So these things are very important to understand because this means we are not realizing what we are doing. This is exactly it. Uh, so, let, But let man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drinks of the cup. So what does it mean to examine oneself? We prepare the Eucharist by examining ourselves. This includes confessing our sins and being reconciled to one another in the sacrament of repentance has come following the four things that he said before. In the Orthodox Church, this confession before God is done in the presence of a priest who visibly presents Christ. And in general, prayers of confession, being worthy does not mean being sinless, but being cleansed. It's not legalism, but commitment to walk in righteousness before God. Um, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So this is the key word, not discerning. Um, this such a power in the body and blood of Christ communicated to us in the eating and drinking of his gifts, that to do so in willful disregard of the Lord could result in sickness and even death. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, so for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I'm going to come back to this. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many Sleep here means to die. For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But if we are judged by the Lord, of course, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. So uh, let's go back to this. So the key one is not discerning the Lord's body. This part here. Who did not discern the Lord and didn't know who he was out of his followers or the disciples? Judas. He thought he was a regular prophet or, you know, regular person. He didn't have much faith in what Jesus was saying. Not even he wanted to listen to him. So he came and approached him and approached him and kissed him. He kissed the Lord and thought he is kissing a mere human being who has no power to do anything. So let's say he was a hypocrite. It's much more than hypocrisy, actually. It is the inability to realize who Christ is in the flesh. So the hypocrisy can be done when the person is a regular person. That's okay. You know, the, we do have hypocrisy, you know, one way or another. But this one was much more. He had, he was confronted many times by the glory of God in Christ over the miracles, the raising of the dead. He was there when he raised Lazarus. When he calmed the sea, when he multiplied the bread, when he did this, when he did that. With all that, he had not discerned, realized, contemplated who that person is, who shocked his disciples many times until Peter has given him a confession. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Judas refused. So the same thing happens today. When we come to the bread and wine and look at them and say, oh, it's just a regular loaf of bread and a regular cup of wine. What harm this can do? And, and, and the apostle is saying, it's exactly like Judas. Not only acting in hypocrisy, but not realizing the glorious presence of Christ under mere bread and wine. Exactly like Judas who did not realize the person, the divinity of the Lord under the manifestation of a mere human being. And he could not realize that this was God in the flesh. So that's that's the piece that I want us to, uh, so this would links, links uh, John 6 at the end about Judas with this piece. That's why, if I go to view quickly, at the beginning of it, he said, on the night he was betrayed. He's opening up this institution narrative with this the phrase night he was betrayed. Who betrayed him? Judas. Why did he bet what they, why did he betray him? Because he did not realize who he was. So anybody who does not realize the presence, the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, 
is actually in a great danger, would have been much easier for them to abstain from taking communion than to take communion in this way. And uh, just a reminder, the four things that the, uh, the Orthodox Study Bible recommend to do, um, examining ourselves, which includes confession, and to reconcile to one another in the sacrament of penance, and to harbor no disbelief or heresy, and to go in order. So it doesn't mean that we should be sinless. It's just we have repented and confessed, acknowledged our sins, repented and confessed it before a priest. We'll come to that at one point about the confession before a priest. So that's that's about the part about the Eucharist, and I wanted to make it you know short and simple. We can go on and on. There's many places where we can talk about this from the Book of Acts. But I will stop here. If you have any question about this part, this is about what really is communion. How does the church see it? And again, when you ask an Orthodox, how do you understand taking the body and blood of Christ? You say, I don't really understand it. I believe Jesus who said, take, eat, this is my body. And this is where I don't really need to understand that I only believe him, as, as Jesus had said. All right. Now I want to go with you to the prayers of the Eucharist. This is the most important prayer, the heart of the worship in the Orthodox Church. And I want to go to how would were the Christians doing it in the early times? How did they do the Eucharistic liturgy? How the church in the beginning, in the very beginning, did that? Uh, so we call it the Eucharistic liturgy because we pray and praise and give thanks to God in the presence of the body and blood of Christ. So Eucharist comes from the Greek Eucharistus, which means thanksgiving, to thank the Lord. So uh, let us go to Justin Martyr on the Eucharist. This is a, a, a martyr who was a defender of the faith, you'd be called an apologetic, who lived in the second century, lived around 150 AD. 50 years after St. John died. So let's see what um, the ancient liturgy would be. So the Catholics would call it ma uh, mass. It's not mass, so we call it the liturgy. So let's go there and see something. One of them would, would show us what Justin Martin had said. Uh, what is this? Um, so St. Justin Martyr laid out one of the earliest description of the Mass, that's Catholic way for say, saying liturgy, in his first apology, written between 153 and 155 AD. It's great because it offers a simplified version of the Catholic or universal, just to say, the universal ancient church theology, intended for those who had no idea what a bishop was or even what amen meant it's like stumbling upon children's Sunday school class for the second century. Very simple. The first apology is great for other reasons as well. He's able to point to specific Roman sects, which mimic Catholic practices like the followers of the Mithras, etc. So what Justin said, this is what we need. But we, as Justin speaks for on behalf of the Christians in the second century, but we, after we have thus washed him, who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching means believed and, and confessed. Bring him to the place where those who are called brethren, the faithful, are, the key word is assembled, in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for the baptized, the eliminated person, and for all others in every place that we may be counted worthy. This is important. This is our first part of the liturgy. The first prayer is a prayer to be counted worthy. Now that we have learned the truth by our works also to be found good citizens and keepers of the commandments so that we may be saved with an everlasting salvation. He's saying that they bring in the one who was washed means baptized, eliminated, and they start offering prayers 
to be worthy. That's the first request in the liturgy, to be worthy. And we're going to talk about that when we come to our Eucharistic liturgy. Having ended that prayer of requesting or petition for worthiness, we salute one another with a kiss. So after that prayer, the, the believers in the second century used to be uh, greeting one, one another with a kiss. And it's very clear that these did not come of vacuum. They didn't were not invented then. Most probably they received them from the apostolic tradition. They received them right there and then. We're talking about the second generations, second generation after the apostles. There is then brought to the president, the one who presides, of the brethren, bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. And, and just a side note, wine was mixed with water because the wine most of the times in the Roman Empire, um, mostly was done, was actually made in Egypt, the best wine. And they used to make it out of raisins, not from grapes. They didn't have the techniques of, um, you know, uh, preserving wine uh, then. The, the, the sulfides and the metabile sulfides and all that stuff. So they uh, used a very concentrated juice to make wine. So when the wine is done, it's very heavy and it's very thick. So they needed to um, dilute it. And so he takes that bread and a cup of wine mixed with water and he takes them, give praises and glory to the father of the universe through the name of the son and of the Holy Ghost and offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands. His means God. And when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, so it's prayer of thanksgiving, that's why it's called Eucharist. Eucharistic means thanksgiving. All the people present, present express their assent. Again, assent means agreement or confession by saying amen. What is Amen? It's almost like talking to children. This word Amen answers in the Hebrew language to go noito or genoito to so be it. Genoito means so be it. As you say, we agree. We all in one heart say yes. And when the president has given thanks and all the people has ex have expressed their assent, those who are called by us deacons Give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine mixed with water, over which the thanksgiving was pronounced, and to those who are absent, they carry away a portion. First, the case of peace is in some new invention. This is what they commented. So worth noting several things in the description. First, the case of peace is in some new invention of the American church to make everybody feel wonderful inside. It's a long-standing universal church tradition. Next, the Eucharist is only open to the baptized individual who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching. So it's not all inclusive. The Eucharist consists of bread and wine mixed with a bit of water. This is a practice done to my knowledge only in the Catholic and the Orthodox churches. Also the, also the Eucharist is brought to the absent. This seems like a minor detail, but it invalidates the Lutheran church Eucharistic views where the blessed bread and wine are incarnated in some sense with Christ during the duration of the service and not afterwards. They go back and become bread and wine again. All of this very much mirrors the modern mass or the liturgy in the, on the Orthodox churches. Prayers of the faithful, the sign of peace, the Eucharistic prayers over the bread and wine mixed with water and the great Amen. However, Justin says, deacons give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine. The other things is which pronounced at this at first, this sounds like he's denying the real presence of Christ, but then you get into the nitty gritty of the Greek where thanksgiving means Eucharist. So he literally saying, deacons give to each of those present to partake of the Eucharist. Eucharitized, bread and wine mixed with water, the, the one that prayer of thanksgiving was prayed over. Uh, in the next chapter, he says this, and this food is called among us Eucharistia, the Eucharist of which no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true and who has been washed with the washing that is for remission of sins and unto regeneration and who is so living as Christ has enjoined. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, 
had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, it is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. That's first apology. So Justin is clear that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word is the flesh and blood of Christ. So when I, when I, I want to make sure that this is actually uh, referred to as the ancient writings of, and not only him, other writers from that age, we do have the same. One of the pieces that we actually, it's a very long one, I'm not going to read it all for you, you're going to be bored to death, I don't want to bore you. It's something called the Constitutions, the Constitution of the Apostles. Again, this is one from the second century. And this is, uh, you find this in, in all the traditions. The Roman Catholic have it, the tradition, the constitution of the apostle. You have it in the Coptic version from very, very ancient times. You have it in the Greek, Byzantine. And so it is, uh, it is something very old from the first uh, three centuries, at least. If, if not specifically from the end of the first century or beginning of second century. So in it, there is a lot of instructions on ordination of priests and bishops, but also on the Eucharist. And I'm gonna read with you that part about the prayer of the faithful. There is a piece here about um, bidding prayer, imposition hands, prayer of penitence uh, for the baptized. Um, but the catechumens are up here, actually. Here's, uh, Divine liturgy, we're in the bidding prayer for the catechumens, the, how they pray for the catechumens, the people who had are new in faith. But then you go, I want to go to the liturgy of the faithful. So it says, O Lord Almighty, the Most High, who dwellest on high, the Holy One that rests, rests among the saints, without beginning, the only potentate who has given to us by Christ, the preaching of knowledge, to the acknowledgement of your glory and, and of your name, which has made known to us, make it bigger. Okay, here we go. Um, known to us for our comprehension, do thou now also look down through him upon this your flock, him is Christ, and deliver it from all ignorance and wicked practice and grant that we may fear you in earnest and love you with affection and have a due reverence of your glory. Be gracious and merciful to them and listen to them when they pray unto you and keep them that they may be unmovable, unblameable, unreprovable, that they may be holy in body and spirit, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but they may be complete, none of them may be the defective or imperfect. O oh, our support, our powerful God, who does not accept persons, be the sister of this your people, which you have redeemed with the precious blood of your Christ, be their protector, aid, pro aider, provider, and guardian, the strong wall of defense, their bulwark or bulwark and security, for none can none can snatch out of your hand. There is no other God like you, for on you is our reliance. Sanctify them by your truth, and goes on and on and on. This is the prayer of the faithful or for the faithful uh, by the priest. There's a piece here, it's referred to James, the brother of John. I, if it is James or not James, it's something from the second century that is attributed to the disciples of the apostles. Uh, he said, the deacon shall immediately say, after the catechumens finished, they get the learning, which they call it the liturgy of the word, the readings. So he says, let none of the catechumens, let none of the hearers, let none hearers mean just listeners. That's another rank. Let none of the unbelievers, hearers usually are believers who done something wrong and they were disciplined by uh, abstaining by cutting them from the Eucharistic the prayer of the, of the faithful. So they listen with the catechumens, they just listen. Let none of the unbelievers, let none of the heterodox, means with heresy, stay here. You have prayed the foregoing prayer, depart. 
Let the mothers receive their children. Let no one having anything against anyone. Let no one come in hypocrisy. Let us stand upright before the Lord with fear and trembling to offer. When this is done, let the deacons bring the gifts to the bishop at the altar and let the presbyters stand on his right hand and on his left as disciples stand before their master. But let two of the deacons on each side of the altar hold a fan made of thin membranes or a feathers of a peacock or of fine cloth and let them silently drive away the small animals and the fly around about talks about flies and that they may not come near the cups. Let the high priest therefore together with the priest pray the, by himself and let him put on his shining garment and standing at the altar, make the sign of the cross upon his forehead with his hand and say the grace of almighty God and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the beginning of the liturgy of the faithful, what we call the anaphora. Anaphora is the word for offering up, lifting up, sacrificing up, something like that. So anaphora, the beginning of it is this. The grace of Almighty God, the Father, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And let all with one voice say, and with your spirit. The high priest says, lift up your heart, your mind or your heart. All the people said, it's meat. It is, sorry. And the, the high priest said, let us give thanks. And the people say, we lift it up unto the Lord. Sorry. So lift up your heart or your mind. We lift it up unto the Lord. The high priest says, let us give thanks to the Lord. That's the Eucharist. The Eucharist. All the people, it is meet and right to do so. What happened here is, um, is a call, an invitation for the Eucharistos, the giving thanks. And it's anaphora of hearts filled with thanksgiving to God. Basically for two reasons. For our creation and the creation of everything created and also for our salvation. So it is very meet and right before all things to sing a hymn to you who art the true God, who art before all beings, <clears throat> from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You, that's another, that's anaphora. That's one of the anaphoras. Um, so when we say anaphora, actually the church brings the best thanksgiving to the Father, the best that we can have. In our church, especially in the Coptic church, in the, in the common anaphora of St. Basil, we pick a prayer. After those introduction greetings, some greetings says, the Lord be with you all, or say, the, the love of God the Father, the grace of the only begotten Son, the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all, the response with your spirit and also with your spirit. Um, and then the, the priest says, lift up your hearts or your minds. The people said, they are with the Lord, or we have them with the Lord. And the third one, let us give thanks to the Lord. So these three actions, first acknowledging the presence of God amongst us, and also the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then the lifting up, the act of lifting up the hearts. In Jewish tradition, they used to lift their hands to acknowledging the lifting up of the heart. And the third one, let us give thanks. Eucharist, Eucharist means to give thanks, which is the name of the prayer. We lift up hearts filled up with thanksgiving in praise to God. So uh, here comes the peace in all the liturgy. You're going to have to have that. For you, eternal God, made all things by him, through him. It is that you vouchsafe, vouchsafe your, uh, your suitable providence over the whole world. For by the very same uh, that you bestowed being, that you also bestowed well-being, the God and Father of your only begotten Son, who by him made all things, the cherubim and the seraphim, the aeons and the hosts, the powers and authorities, the principalities, the throne, the archangels and the angels. So I'm going to stop here. So this is the ancient liturgy, the ancient way they did the liturgy. Saint Justin Martyr said, you start by a prayer of asking for worthiness, and then you offer the anaphora over the bread and wine. So when I go to uh, the liturgy, see if I can get it from here, the liturgy of St. Basil.
some documents. I'm going to get uh, this folder and we'll go over here. No, that's not going to work. Uh, C liturgical, maybe that's it. Uh, need some basil, some serious and basil. That's the liturgy of some basil. Let's go to. That's the soldier. Let's go further. And that's the offering. I'm just going to go to the liturgy where we start. Actually, the heart of the liturgy is the, and that's the catechumens. Move forward. And liturgies. Okay, that's the first prayer that I want to look into. So let us make that exercise and see if you notice anything in this prayer. This prayer is done after the creed. When everybody's reciting the creed, that's how we begin our liturgy of the faithful. After the readings of the gospel, after the sermon, immediately after the sermon, the priest would go into the altar, wash his hands. And then as the people are reciting the creed, we believe in one God, God the Father. And we need to memorize the creed. Everybody, everybody recited many times. We start what we call the prayer of reconciliation. And uh, let's read the prayer together and see what you get out of it. What is this a prayer about? So the priest, after asking everybody to pray, he can say, let's stand up. And then he gives the peace, the mark of Christ. And then he goes, O great and eternal God, who created man in incorruption, means without decay. And by the life-giving manifestation of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, you destroyed the death, which has intrude, was introduced into the world by the envy of the devil. You have filled the earth with the heavenly peace, for which the host of angels glorify you, saying, Glory be to God in the highest peace on earth, goodwill toward men. You can say pray, pray for perfect peace, for love, and the pure apostolic kisses. Now, focus on this one and tell me, what does this fit from what we already had talk, talked about? Out of your goodness, O God, fill our hearts with your peace. Cleanse us from all lust, every deceit, every hypocrisy, every vile deed, from every memory of evil and dealing death. Grant us our master that we all become worthy to greet one another with a holy kiss that through jesus our lord we may share your immortal and heavenly gift without falling into condemnation if we have been following up until now what this piece of prayer fit into we call it reconciliation anyone remember We'll come back to it. See this part? They bring in the baptized. And uh, so we offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for baptized. For all others in every place that we may be made counted worthy now to be found good citizen so that we may save an everlasting salvation. So that prayer we call the prayer of worthiness. That we ask God to, to make to, to count us worthy, to see us as ready. And this is basically to avoid to avoid the peace that St. Paul talked about and John talked about of that no discerning, not discerning the body and blood of Christ. So this is the first one. This is a great worry in the mind of the church that any people, anybody who is standing there in the church ready to prepare for the Eucharistic prayer 
and taking communion, they're not really ready. So this prayer is a must do before we start. And response, the church looked into this and we have that prayer. So out of your goodness, O God, fill our hearts with your peace, cleanse us. Grant us to, that we become worthy to greet one another so that we, we don't fall into condemnation. We are worried about every member that they are not ready to take the, the body and blood of Christ and not to share in the heavenly praise. And by that, they consider the, it will be a condemnation against them. They will fall into that um, unworthy trap. So I hope that is clear. All right. So what Saint Justin Martin had said been done in the first, in the second century, in the big, in the beginning of the church. It's exactly what the church has done in the liturgy by giving us a first prayer of the faithful. It's called the prayer of reconciliation, so that we don't have anything to separate us from one another, and from God. This is this is the reconciliation that we're looking for from each other and from God. Okay, that's why we say things like, um, lust, that's something that will not count as worthy, that we had not confessed about it. Deceit, harboring evil in the heart. Hypocrisy, false pretense of things. Vile deed and even memory of evil and dealing death. And sometimes I say this, all these I have done, the one about lust, deceit, hypocrisy, evil deed. But what about memory of evil? Things done to me that makes me hold grudges against people in the church. So because I need to come to kiss one another. At the end of this, of the prayer of worthiness, what did Justin Martin say to do? He said, having ended the prayer, we salute one another with a kiss. We kiss one another. And guess what? After this prayer is done, the deacon says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, hear us and have mercy on us. Let us offer. Let us offer. Let us offer in order. Stand the reverence and look these toward. Look, let us attend. The, the, this is the time when people used to offer things. The, uh, in that time, they lift up the covering of the altar and the uh, stand at the door of the altar in the old times and people will put their gifts after the greeting of one another why is that very simply because jesus said that look at this and the church is very faithful to the gospel and the, and the commandments of christ if you came to offer your gifts and remembered that's Matthew 5.23 um, and that's how it goes this is how I wanted to conduct this is one of the translation if you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge uh, a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right, then and only then come back and work things out with God, which is a, a, a weird translation, but it's Matthew 5.23. If you want to look at it in uh, New King James, this is what would be Matthew Question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm very excited. Some somebody's <laughs> talking other than me. Wow. <laughs> like, let me finish before you get too excited, okay? I want all right. no expectations. Go ahead. <laughs> so for that, this prayer um, before uh, the Eucharist about you know remembering you know about these lustful thoughts to see um, harboring bad thoughts. So let's say an individual has that is this meant as a purification type prayer or is this more of a remembrance that you need to stop and consult a priest beforehand 
No, actually the consulting the priest and the confession has to happen before. This is almost as a like, like a last minute examination, a self-examination. So mm -hmm. I'm looking into my heart and I make a general examine and general confession before God. It's last minute. So that the church makes very every effort so that when we approach that great praise of the church unified together as one body and, and one mind, we make sure that we don't fall into those four issues. I, we, we said before the, uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the um, immorality, right? That's lust at the beginning or the evil deeds. And then the second one is the uh, disunity, the hate and the grudges and all the things that, that breaks us to break us apart so we're not in one body. And then the heresy that we don't have any um, bad or bad uh, teaching or bad uh, theology that's not agreeable with the church. And the last one is the disorder. That's why this offer in order and all that stuff. Um, so that's that's like a, a general examination, not not to consult it, but if someone, and actually it's a good, good point to check and say if someone has something that grave they need to talk about with the priest and have absolution before, then they definitely need to um, avoid the communion at this point and then just make it another time. Okay, yeah, I was just, <clears throat> wondering in churches i haven't uh, been able to attend yet and obviously I've, i'm not denominational at this point but I, I didn't know if that meant there was a um if you were repenting with a priest before this would happen or if this is more just a general overview over something very it is a general overview and a reminder for people to uh, to be careful we're approaching something very high and very holy and holy and solemn okay um, so that's exactly it so this is what Jesus had said. This is actually where the prayer of the, the calling of the deacon is very important. He says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, it says, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come to offer your gift. Why is this relevant? Because we do the, the, the case of peace that we actually reconcile with one another before in the old times, not, not now, we don't do that now. Before they take the covering of the altar and they go to the door of the altar and everybody come in order in line and they start offering things. People, you know, in the old times used to bring eggs, the chicken, um, meat, grapes, bread, uh, grain, whatever they get, uh, money. So they take all that and put it on the altar. So uh, that's why in the prayer of the deacon, and this is what I wanted to say, or the, the calling of the deacon, greet one another with the Holy Ghost. That's how we begin. And then he says, let us offer, let us offer, let us offer in order. Then after we finish offering, stand the reverence and look toward the east. Means you're going to be chaotic a little bit with the movement of people around to get their offering to the altar. And that's very old. And it's still prayed, although we don't do that. We offer our all, offering all, almost all monetary in, in a box in the back. But uh, this is new. In the old times, there was... Uh, uh, that what we call the prosperine and the Greek for gift or offering. Um, so um, that prosperine has to do with, we remind us or has to do with the shroud of Christ that we wrap things in it. So uh, that's, that's where this prayer comes. So after that, once we finish with doing this, Justin Martyr says, we go into a lengthy prayer of thanksgiving. And that is, is a second piece of the liturgy and the most important, most significant prayer of the church. And we, it's called rightly here, the heavenly hymn, and I'm going to talk about that maybe next time, is that it starts with the same greeting. Yeah, one, one liturgy, the same Basil says, the Lord means Christ, be with you all. And uh, the answer is, and when you, with your spirit. And so we saw in the constitution, uh, it starts with the one from St. Gregory. We use the other one, St. Gregory, the grace of God, uh, the love of God, the Father, the grace of the only begotten Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. This is from St. Paul greeting. Be with you all. And the answer is the same. And with your spirit. Lift up your minds or your hearts. And the answer is they are with the Lord. That's from the Constitution, second century prayer. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is meat, not he is meat. This is a mistake. It is meet and right. It is not about he is worthy, right and worthy. No, we can't say that. It is. Right means fit or just. And uh, we can say um, 
fit and just. That's what I would say. That's what we need to do. No, it's not about him. That's a wrong translation. Then we go into just a meet and write, meet and write, or right and worthy, meet and write, meet and write. And truly indeed, it is again, this is wrong. Meet, meet and write. And the next prayer is very interesting. And then I'm, I'm gonna leave this, oh, what time is it now? Um, I think it is almost eight. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here because the next one is actually coming from the book of Revelation. And it's very interesting to see how this is linked. Let's go through this first and then we'll go back. Um, o Lord and Master God of truth, existing before the ages and reigning forever, abiding in the highest and beholding the Lord. This is very close to the constitution prayer, the constitution of the apostles. So it says, existing before the ages and reigning forever. Almost like uh, was and is to be. Who created the secured, created heaven, earth, sea, and everything therein. The Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom you created all things, seen and the unseen. Who sits upon the throne of his glory and is worshipped by all the holy powers. So why created is the key word, because this prayer is a thanksgiving for creation. Let's we'll say, God the creator. And let us see how it goes. Before whom stand the angels, the archangels, the principalities, the dominions, the thrones, the lordships, and the powers. These are all heavenly ranks mentioned in St. Paul letters. St. Paul told us about all these ranks. It's most probably a Jewish tradition out of visions. Around you stand a cherubim, and we will hear about them in the book of Revelation, full of eyes, and, and the six-winged seraphim, praising continuously without failing, saying, deacon saying, attend. And uh, the people, all of the people would sing, uh, the cherubim worship you. The song is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. So uh, this is the first prayer of the anaphora. And it's a thanksgiving prayer or a praise for God being, the first praise, the creator who created. We praise him for being the creator who created all things, seen and unseen. We talk about heaven, earth, sea, and everything therein. And also we go to the unseen, the invisible, the principalities, the archangels, the angels, the dominions, the thrones, the lordships, and the powers the cherubim and the seraphim. So all these things that God has created and we cannot see. So the first praise is a praise of God as the creator. And if you look at the Bible and really examine it carefully about all the songs, you will not have it outside those two items, creation first, and what's the second item? And the second item is the second praise. When the people says holy, 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 the priest also says in Greek, Agios, 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 and he repeats it again. Holy, holy, true, truly, you are holy, O Lord, our God, who formed, created, and placed us in the paradise of delight. So he's moving on from the creation to something else. And when we broke your holy commandment through the serpent's deceit, we were deprived of eternal life and exiled from the paradise of delight. You did not abandon us to the end or entirely, but contact us continually through your holy prophets and finally or the last days you appear to us who were living in darkness in the shadow of death through your only begotten son our lord god and savior jesus christ who is of the holy spirit and the virgin May. he's going to start talking about jesus so why did jesus the son was revealed no more creation i guess all well, you can think about the new nature as creation but he was sent because he's called the savior so the second job of god is salvation so the second praise of the anaphora is God, the savior. First one, we praise God as the creator. The second one, we praise God as the savior. He was incarnated and became man and taught us the way of salvation. So we look, we focus very much, we zero on, on the person of the son, on Jesus, as God's way of saving us. Yes, we, God created us by him and before time, but he also saved us by him 
How did he save us? We tell the story of the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary was incarnated, means became flesh and became human and taught us the ways of salvation. He taught. He granted us the grace of the rebirth from above through water and spirit. He baptized us. He made us a united people unto him and purified us by your Holy Spirit. That's a very summarized word on his salvific work. He made us pure people, united people and pure by your Holy Spirit. We speak to the Father. By the way, all of St. Basil language is addressed to the Father. When you go to St. Gregory, it's addressed to the Son. But at least in St. Basil, we know we're talking, the priest talks to the Father, the congregation speaks to Christ. He loved his own who are in the world. For our salvation, he gave himself up to death that had possessed us, whereby we were bound and sold on account of our sins. We were actually slaves bound to death because of the sins that we have committed. He descended into Hades through the cross. And then he rose from the dead on the third day. He ascended to the heavens and sat down at the right hand of of your right hand, O oh Father. He, he appointed a day for retribution on which he will appear to judge the living and the dead in equality in equity and reward each one according to his deeds. That's how we approach something very important, which is the institution. And then we go into the institution to God. So this all, the second part from Agios, holy, 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 is a God's salvation. At the summit of this prayer is the institution. What St. Paul had said that Jesus had done on the night he was betrayed. He instituted this great mystery of godliness for us. This is part of our salvation. So we say, God, thank you, Lord. We praise you for being the creator of everything we have. And at that point, I think I personally, a priest, I think about all the things that God has given me as a creator, my existence, my health, my family, food, drink, sunlight, company, society, material gifts, spiritual gifts, everything that he had done. But then when I come to this part, I thank God for his forgiveness, for the gift of his son who died so that I can be forgiven and my sins will be completely wiped out. So in, among that is the institution of the great Eucharist. So when he was determined to surrender himself up to death for the life of the world, and it's not, it's a little bit different than St. Paul and he says on the night he was betrayed because he wanted to highlight the unworthiness of some people. This one is about Jesus, his own determination to surrender himself to death for the life of the world. He took bread, the same words St. Paul used. He took bread upon his pure, spotless, undefiled, and blessed hand, life-giving hands. And then he looked up toward heaven, to you, O God, his Father and Master of all. He gave thanks, he blessed it, he sanctified it. And then He broke it and gave it to his holy disciples and pure apostles saying, take and eat of it, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you and for many to be given for remission of sins to this in remembrance of me. People says, amen, the great amens. There's many times, many amens of those in the liturgy. Likewise, after supper, he took the, the chalice, mixed it of wine and water. He gave thanks, he blessed it. He sanctified it. Um, and then he tasted and gave it also to his holy disciples and pure also seeing, taking. So each of them, six steps, if you count them, uh, very much, they, they are counted, actually. So when you say, uh, beginning, six actions Jesus took, bread, looked up, two, give thanks, three, blessed, four, sanctified, five, And we think of broke and gave as one. He broke it and gave it, and that's six. And the same, the same thing after supper, he took the chalice, took, mixed it too, and he gave thanks, three, blessed it, four, sanctified it, five, and he tasted and gave six. So we have six actions. Um, and then at the end, we do what St. Paul had said to do, he said, we, we say, the people, all of them says, amen, amen, amen. They speak to Christ. Now, we're not, I'm speaking as a priest to the Father. We, I say he in the third person. The people says, you, your death. So we preach your death, O Lord. On your holy resurrection ascension, we confess. We praise you. We bless you. We thank you, O Lord. That we supplicate you, our God. So uh, this is exactly what's simple for each time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup. 
you proclaim the death of the Lord, preach the death of the Lord and confess his resurrection and remember him till he comes. That's what the priest is saying. And the people are repeating it again, as St. Paul had mentioned it in his letter. And then we go into a piece, we call it the anamnesis, the commemoration, the remembrance. Anamnesis is not to forget. It's not just a memorial of somebody. So I'm going to stop here so that when next time when we come, I will refer to you, I will go with you to the pieces from the liturgy in heaven. The, this praise is coming from a specific place in heaven. And it's really uh, interesting to see how the church took that and placed it in her uh, very essential praise that's, that, the, that the church does all the time. Yeah, let's say our Father. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Make us worthy, O Lord, say thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not to temptation, but to the verse from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, I is the kingdom, power, and glory now and forever. May the love of God, the Father, and grace is only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peace be with you. Christ is risen. <laughs>